Good afternoon. We are on the uh, penultimate discussion. That's the second from the end. <coughs> this is the first discussion of politics, philosophical politics, in the book. Politics, in my opinion, is the easiest branch of philosophy by far. And uh, within the two chapters that I devote to it, chapter 10 is even easier than chapter 11. So I come to the conclusion that this is the easiest and most obvious chapter in the book. And the uh, structure of it is simplicity itself. Man has rights. The function of government is to protect them. And every other theory is wrong. That's it. <laughs> <clears throat> that is the three sequences of this chapter. So you can call this the base of politics. That's really what it is. Uh, it's still very abstract. You would be surprised how many people could read uh, chapter 10, or at least most of it. I could excise a few paragraphs that would antagonize them, but most of it. Just the idea, man has inalienable rights and the government shouldn't violate them, it should protect them. Uh, and, and dictatorship and anarchy and so on are wrong, and agree and say, well, that is basically Americanism. Uh, find nothing particularly controversial, and more than that, not have any idea what that would mean in terms of an economic system. Not have any idea what a revolution that would mean in terms of the market, the supply and demand, etc. In other words, make no connection between Americanism and capitalism. And yet, of course, the burden of chapter 11 is to say, if you agree with these obvious political principles, you must be committed to complete, let's say, fair capitalism. So 11 introduces nothing new. It's merely chewing or applying in detail to one special realm, the issue of e economics, what is stated abstractly in 10. Uh, so 11 contains nothing new, and yet for most people it contains the bombshell of what's new. But if you think in principle, the reverse is true. If you're going to fight 11, you have to fight it on in 10. If you let 10 through, you can't. 11 is just uh, like the later theorem. So I would say that, that uh, 11 is to 10 as 8 is to 7. Seven lays the ethical base, and eight on virtue then choose the details. And then similarly, ten lays the political base, and eleven choose the political details. Now let's look first at the issue of rights, those few preliminary things I want to just point out to you. Uh, why this is the first question. You must consider if you want to establish an organized society. Now, on page 398, uh, i just point out to you methodologically, you cannot just in philosophy or in any proper course of thinking plunge in and say, the first question I want to consider is X, because that leaves open what question? Why do you want to consider it? Are you right to consider it? Is this hierarchically the foundation? So I have to show that before you can discuss organized society, if that's the concern of politics and government, we must first discuss this question of rights. So I begin it by saying it's the basic principle and then why. And the explanation really starts in the very bottom of 397. Even if men interacted on some island, but did so at random, uh, the issue of rights would be premature. It's when men decide to form, and I like very much, if I may say so, or reform, because you've got to have one that's completely warped. So you have to form it again. You see the, the pun on reform. Form again and reform in the sense of improve. I, I must say I like that little story. <laughs> When men do decide to form or reform an organized society, when they decide to pursue systematically the advantages of living together, then they need the guidance of principle. 
Why do they need the guidance of principle? How do we know they do? Because we know that any long-range goal has to be achieved by reference to the guidance of principle. Now, what kind of principle has to guide human action? Moral principles, that's what moral principles are for. So we have this question. If your society is to be moral and therefore practical, why and therefore, how does it follow and therefore practical? Because the moral, you see, we're counting on all the things we've already established. You must begin by recognizing the moral requirements of man in a social context. Now, does man have moral requirements? Well, we know he does. The whole of essence, the whole of ethics is this is what's required by morality in order to uh, sustain your life. Does he have moral requirements in a social context? Well, if he's got them by his nature, he's got them in every context. So we want to know, are there moral requirements in a social context? Now, here's where I slip something over, not unfairly, but elliptically. And I say, i.e., you must define the sphere of sovereignty mandated for each individual by the laws of morality. Now, that does not follow, i.e., is literally speaking a mistake there, because I.E. means it is. In other words, that is to say, and if I say, what are the moral requirements of man in society, I can't go from that to, what is the sphere of sovereignty the individual should have, given the laws of morality? Why can't I? Not from that alone, because it depends on what kind of morality. If I believe in self-sacrifice, and what are then the moral, as the essence of ethics, and I say, what is the moral requirements of man in a social context, that he should have abundant opportunity to sacrifice himself, you see. There would be no such question as, as a, a sphere of sovereignty. But I'm here taking for granted the objectivist definition of man's moral requirements, and we've gone through all those virtues. He's got to think on his own. He's got to be... A, Egoistic, he's got to do it for himself. He's got to be independent. He's got to cling to his judgment no matter who says what. He's got to have integrity. He doesn't survive through others but by his own productive effort. I mean, every single one of those virtues is one form or another of he's got to be left alone, function on his own, be autonomous. So by now, when I'm saying, what are the moral requirements in this context? I can easily say, in other words, no matter what the government does, what are the things they have to leave alone and untouched if he's to be able to function uh, and sustain his life, you see? Uh, without the chapter on the virtues, you never would get to that. But with the chapter on the virtues, it should slide over so easily that I could get away with IE because you're filling in all the earlier chapters to justify that uh, IE. But this, you see, is really the basis of right. Why man uh, needs rights is because he needs an independent existence. Others can't take away a certain kind of independence. Why? Because that's the independence that ethics tells us he has to practice in order to live. And that is the real root of rights. And of course, it goes back to the fact that he's a rational being. If he, if he weren't, he'd have to survive through others, and then he wouldn't have that kind of independence. So uh, th that should make, I think, really clear where rights come from and why they don't come from uh, God. And also why we start with this question, because we can't even get the government in the picture until we know what is untouchable about ma men as individuals so that they can survive at all. And then we can worry about what you can do to them or with them or through them or when they get together, etc. cetera. Uh, and then, of course, the standard right, and the, uh, this is uh, um, on 398, there's a good uh, paragraph there, paragraph 3, because I uh, it, it tried to figure out if there's some way I could separate out why these, there's the right to life obviously is the primary, but why these three, you know, corollaries of it rather than 12 or 2 or whichever, and the, I, I mean, I can't say I have a numerical proof, but 
What I was able to do is show that each one of those involved something, each one of the derivatives involved an obvious essential of life. To sustain, and here we're in the middle of 398, paragraph 3. To sustain his life, man needs a method of survival. Well, that is obvious. Every species needs a method uh, of survival. And what is his method? To use his mind, come to conclusions, and act accordingly. Well, what is that called? Liberty. So liberty is really the right to the method of survival, of the human method of survival. Now, part of that method is that he has to create the material means of his survival. He has to perform a certain process to do so. So he's got to, as part of that method, have the right to a certain process of creativity, to initiate it and keep the results. And that is the right to property. And he can't enact the, the process or the method unless he has a certain kind of motive. And we already know from chapter 7 that life requires a certain kind of motivation. And the right to that motive is the pursuit of happiness. So uh, I think it's not accidental that these particular rights were formulated as they were. They go to the key point, concretizing what does life consist of. It's like somehow doing something for some goal. And once you say that, you say life, liberty, property, the pursuit of happiness. Now later, if you recall, I have a paragraph which was held to word, but which I think is finally clear, on why those are the only rights discussed by philosophical politics, as against you know, the freedom of speech and trial by jury and all that. These are the only universals uh, that rest directly on the principles of ethics. So thankfully, once more, I can shovel into the field of the philosophy of law, all that other stuff. Now, one thing that I keep stressing in the chapter is uh, the interconnection of rights. We are so used to the idea that rights are just a disparate collection of prerogatives granted by Congress that you can take one and not have the other and so on. Rights are like virtues. It's all or nothing. Because, in fact, rights are the right to practice the virtues. So you can't, you, can't inter you can't have one right without the other. And I say that over again in many different ways, uh, starting, for instance, on the top of 399, or the second paragraph. Since man is an integrated being of mind and body, every right entails every other. None is definable apart from the rest, that's the theory. None is possible in practice apart from the rest. So they are merely aspects of one totality, exactly as the virtues are aspects of one way of life, or as metaphysics and epistemology and ethics are aspects of one integrated philosophy. And the, the idea of pulling out one right and say, I'm for liberty, but down with property, which is, you know, widely done today in one form or another, uh, uh, is inconceivable to anybody who understands the issues that are being talked about here. And it has to be traced. Such a splintered, disintegrated consciousness that uh, it's not possible to argue with or against such a thing. You have to take the person back to, uh, I don't know, back to the idea that, uh, that knowledge is integration, and school him in that thoroughly before he even come near the topic of rights because he, he obviously is not capable of thought. That's putting it in his kindest terms. <laughs> now, even though they are all interconnected, that does not mean that they're primary. Each a right is a tremendous derivative in the hierarchical structure. If we start with axioms on the floor, and then we build up epistemology and its theorems and so on, and then we have the ethics, and then all of the virtues. We're getting already, if, we, if the total of philosophy is a skyscraper, we're getting pretty high up. By the time we get to rights, you start to need an oxygen mask. So by that very fact that it's so high up on the structure, it can't possibly be self-evident. Because the way you validate it is to take it back all the way down to the directly perceivable. 
And I indicate how to do that, if you know uh, chapter 4, that the essential thing you have to do is reduce the higher level content, back down step by step. I indicate the structure of the reduction in that long paragraph in the middle of uh, 399. And each, uh, going upward in the way I wrote it, man is a certain kind of living organism. That's the nature of man. And that leads to, he needs morality and specifically life as the standard. That's into ethics. And that means he's got a right to act by this standard, because by what else, etc. And in each case, you will see, you can reduce it going in the other direction, from the right to the ethical principle underneath it, to the view of man underneath it. And then, of course, the view of man himself, as we said, is the culmination, largely, of the material earlier, going back to concept formation, objectivity, volition, and ultimately the axioms of existence and consciousness. So the right stand on that whole uh, 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 structure. And then uh, to stress further the interconnection, I want to clarify that you don't interpret this paragraph as meaning that uh, the right to life rests on one ethical principle and the right to uh, property rests on a different one and so on. And why couldn't that, why is that approach out? Ethics is not a grab bag of separate principles. Therefore, it's true that this principle, A, may be the primary root of a certain right, B. But by the fact that that ethical principle is interconnected to all the others, and that the rights are interconnected to all the others, every right by itself will rest on every moral principle. You couldn't get the right without that whole system. And the virtues themselves you couldn't get without the whole foundation. So ultimately, every right rests on every principle going all the way back to the axiom. Now, I don't, uh, for a graduate class, that would be a good exercise to do that. But for, the, for this book, I just showed that of the, the, all the various principles that uh, I gave in 399, each one underlies all rights. And uh, that's the paragraph starting on 399. Why they all rest on life as the standard. They all rest on the fact that man survived by reason. They all right, rest on the fact that man is productive. And they all rest on egoism. So now you would think we have uh, interconnected uh, uh, all the rights to each other and to all their roots and to all their roots and shown the need of it and uh, validated uh, the principle. And that's basically the essential positive content in this first uh, sequence. The rest is, as far as I recall, the rest is, is essentially polemics. And I picked out of the mass of chaos four uh, increasingly bizarre and irrational theories of rights, economic rights, collective rights, fetal rights, and animal rights. And uh, now that is strictly speaking polemics, but it, I just couldn't resist it. I mean, I was past the point of being open to reason at this point because, uh, you know, you want to get something in about this insanity. Now I had very little to say about economic and collective rights, because those go back to when I was a child. Even if collective rights is much worse now than it used to be, but those are kind of old hat, new deal rights. And when we get to fetal and animal rights, these are things that no civilized person would have said when I was growing up. Nobody, not even in the church. Or if they did, I never heard it. And it, you know, they didn't tear down Wichita, Kansas, and, Etc. Uh, so I, I wanted it's very essential to get this uh, uh, point down, although it's just an application of objectivism. Ayn Rand took this as a tremendous political indicator. And she told me once that just about any political issue that she could imagine, a candidate could conceivably take the wrong side for an innocent or, you know, partly innocent reason but that abortion to her was the pure indicator 
of his central honesty and his respect for human life because she said she could not see anything other than malice and hatred that could underscore, underlie the idea of the rights of the protoplasm at the expense of the life of the uh, uh, and pursuit of happiness uh, of the mother. And so she took this as an indicator. And as a matter of fact, I was in her apartment when Reagan was first considering running. Or he, I think he was, yes, he hadn't run yet. And we called his headquarters and said that we liked, uh, this is for president, that we liked several of the things that uh, he was saying, but uh, we wanted to know what his attitude was toward abortion. And somebody on the phone said, well, we have not yet come to a decision on this, but, but uh, he did uh, allow abortion in California when he was the governor, and they tried to reassure him. And we said, well, do you know when he'll be decided that she, this woman said, well, it's being decided right now. Not in that room, of course. But, and then, of course, sure enough, very soon thereafter, he came out as this militant anti-abortionist uh, and then locked Bush in the whole Republican right into this uh, uh, viewpoint. Now, to get back from politics for a minute, um, Ayn Rand's whole case uh, against abortion is down to two principles. I, they're seared in my mind because I was asked once by uh, Metro Media in New York City. They had a guy called Dr. Martin Aben in those years. I don't know if he's still alive. And he, he used to, is he still around? Nobody from here. Um, he used to come on and take on liberals. He was an arch uh, conservative. And, um, he wanted to come on and attack abortion. So they asked me, would I you know, defend abortion? And I said, sure. So I said to him, you know, you get so many seconds and that's it. And then they just take the camera off. It doesn't make any difference. But, you know, I said to her, what, what would you say if you had to condense it all down and blurt out two sentences and they're taking the camera? She said, just get in two sentences. A potential is not an actual and it's depraved to sacrifice the non-human to the human. See, the, the, which is what you're doing in abortion because you're telling the woman that she uh, uh, sacrificed the human to the non-human. I mean, you're taking the woman and saying your life is worth nothing, your goals are, don't matter, you are just a vehicle to raise this protoplasm, which is nothing at this moment but something, you know, uh, growing inside you. So I, you know, I've, repeated those points as firmly as I could in the seconds that I had. And of course, he didn't bat an eye because the whole idea of a TV debate is to just yell louder and say it the second time. But after it was over and they turned the red light off, he said, that's an interesting point. <laughs> and, <laughs> but he, he kept going forever on that. You know. Anyway, my point here is, I think the good point here the, the good sentence, uh, uh, 402, this, this second paragraph, just as there are no rights of collections of individuals, that's the collective rights, so there are no rights of parts of individuals, because that's really what it comes down to. This was a kind of a metaphysical formulation that occurred to me. The unit of rights has to be the individual, not more than one and not less than one. Uh, there's no rights of your arm, or of a tumor, et cetera. And then, of course, I go right into Ms. Rand's point. And then I must say, uh, uh, I like this sentence. At the end, I liked it better until I heard Professor Williams say it off the top of his head the other night, but that which lives within the body of another can claim no prerogatives against its host. Uh, I think that's a good point, and he essentially made it the other night. So, uh, so much for uh, abortion. Now, as to animal rights, uh, I mean, you know, it is, it is a question in my mind is how far can you argue against these rights because there's now rights of rivers, rights of the earth, you know, rights of uh, the ozone layer, rights of the universe. Uh, uh, and um, at some point, if you start arguing about it, you give it the dignity that this is an arguable issue. 
On the other point, I, this far I, I, I had to go because it's, uh, it's an example of the theory running hog wild because people have no philosophic idea of what rights depends on. So they've now taken it to all that's required is the ability to experience pain. And then the step, and therefore animals have rights. And then the next step is all that's required is the ability to have the metabolism and be alive. And then there's going to be all that's required is the occupancy of three dimensions. Uh, and then there's going to be the final idea that to be equals to have a right. So every molecule has a right. Therefore, every time you walk, you're disturbing conventions of molecules. I mean, it's, it's, it's production right absurdity with the entire thing. And the whole point, of course, is that the source of rights is a conceptual level consciousness, not a perceptual level consciousness. So if you have that, you couldn't dream of making animals. The, uh, that's as far as, I, as I'm going to go with false rights. Now, I do want to point out an important point on 403. Ms. Rand's new point in political theory was that rights can be violated only by the use of uh, physical force. And then I think it's a good explanation, the second and last paragraph on 403, why she was able to grasp that. Because on the face of it, it's, it's pretty clear that you can't take away someone's property except by grabbing it, and you can't take away his life except by killing him and physically, etc. But what is it that made it necessary, or made it, made it possible for her to understand as a broad theoretical issue that only physical force, direct or indirect, can violate rights? Since a lot of people knew about rights, and had a whole legal code, but that, they never formulated that principle. Well, I, my answer is given in the second last paragraph of 403. It's that it, her ethics permitted that. Not her politics, but her ethics. And specifically the fact that since she chose the functioning of the mind as the essence of virtue, she was attuned for the first time to what can inhibit or prevent the functioning of the mind? What social conditions, what can other men do to interfere or stop with the functioning of the mind? She could raise that as a question uh, of concern because she's oriented to the mind and what it needs. And of course, when she raised the question that way, it didn't take her long, quite apart from politics, to realize that coercion is force, is the antonym of mind which we already discovered, discussed in chapter 8. Why? Because it's the only thing that stops the mind. Any other vice can make it harder for a man to think, but force is the only thing that turns off the thinking faculty, you see. And therefore, if right is simply the right to a process, there's no way to stop you doing the process except by force. Anything else can disappoint you, upset you, hurt you, and make you miserable. But if it doesn't involve the use of force, it leaves you free to think and act. And that means it doesn't touch your rights, you see. So uh, uh, it's, a, it's an excellent tie-in between uh, morality and politics. It's, it's, it's her understanding of the moral evil of force that enabled her to understand the political evil of force. Uh. Now, since uh, um, uh, uh, rights are viable only by physical force, we can say with a completely clear understanding that rights are objective, and that violations of rights can be objectively defined and recognized, because any such violation has to reduce to a specific physical act. It has to come down in effect to some form of one person punching another in the nose. There's nothing else. There's no other way. I mean, it can be a very complex, subtle, indirect, but it has to be reducible to the simplicity and perceptual level obviousness of a punch in the nose. And uh, whereas if you talk about you violated somebody's right to leisure, or their right to education, or their right to emotional fulfillment, there's nothing what 
whatever that you can specify that is perceivable that you can say, this wrongdoer is guilty because of X. It's impossible. Because it's, it's not a right definable that's legitimately definable, and it, its violation can't be reduced to a physical act. Okay, um, I'm open for questions on this first section. Uh, you uh, mentioned that uh, validation, such as the example of rights resting on all the ethical principles, and then on the whole structure of this knowledge and so on, uh, the whole hierarchical structure needed to validate. How have any men been able to validate any of these principles prior to objecting? Well, that's a very good question. If the uh, rights rest on such a complex foundation, how has anybody been able to validate them prior to objectivism? And the answer is, in part, they never really have. They have never given a full objective validation of rights. And the first ones to say so are the Founding Fathers, because they simply say we hold these truths to be self-evident. Now, maybe they did honestly believe they were self-evident, but self-evident is another way of saying, you know, it's obvious, look and you'll see, we have no further argument to, to, to present. Now, no value judgment, and rights is obviously a type of value judgment, can possibly be self-evident, unless you say it's self-evident deliverance of God, which is partly why they say, you know, that rights come from God. So that all they can do in terms of validation is put together a kind of common sense Aristotelian viewpoint with the trappings of some religion and say, well, everybody agrees with rights. But you see, that, that, that kind of thing doesn't last. Now, it doesn't mean that, they, that therefore they had rights with no real foundation because, you know, they didn't have it in the Middle Ages. St. Augustine didn't come out for rights. So they had to have a, a lot in some form that led to it. And what they had, of course, in one form or another was a belief in this world, with the supernatural world being, you know, just a fading uh, remnant. They had the idea that you could make sense of life. They had the idea that you should pursue your own happiness, and that self-preservation was really crucial, albeit, you know, so that you could carry out God's uh, intentions. They had from Aristotle and the Greeks, and from the the temporary relaxation of religion before Kant and skepticism started again. They had a, enough of a foothold on a common sense to reach rights, but they couldn't hold it. It would be impossible as soon as Kant collapsed that foundation, then rights became what they are today. The, the whole word just lost its meaning. So in other words, you could get away with it up to a point, but uh, it, it won't last. My understanding about the subject of abortion that this trend as I read it, it sounds like the transition from potential to actual occurs as the fetus sort of travels through the birth canal. Is that essentially what you're saying? When does the transition from the potential to the actual occur in regard to the fetus? In that form, I do not regard that as a philosophic question. That is, would have to be a biological question. What I can say is this. The moment that the uh, entity is born and the uh, cord is severed and it's biologically now a separate entity, that is obviously an actual human being. Uh, there is, however, a borderline area in there where it's to all intents and purposes formed. It wouldn't even need to be in an incubator, you know, let us say. Uh, and uh, it's still in the mother, but simply hasn't been born. Where you could argue that the thing has already been actualized and is this sort of thing resting between two dimensions. Now, how much structure has to be uh, formed uh, internally before you say it's actualized? I don't know enough biology to know. Certainly, it has to be viable. And beyond that, it has to have its main growth done. So that uh, you know, it's not like taking an egg out and sticking it in, a, uh, in an incubator and then it grows for eight months. That does not make it actual. So not, not only has to be viable, that is capable of living outside the mother, it has to be essentially formed. Uh, now I want to add one more thing. Th I do not, however, endorse the, the following. 
Even suppose you could prove, say in the uh, seventh month, that this uh, fetus was not formed, was still had a lot of significant growing, and was a potential uh, only at this stage. It does not follow that any woman is morally entitled to say, let's kill it. That does not follow. And the question is, what is her reason? Because uh, women worship is no more applicable to, to uh, fetal entities than they are to animals. Animals have no rights. But you have no moral right to go up to a, a, even your own dog and say, uh, uh, I'm fed up and I'm in a bad mood today and stick an ice pick in its throat. Now, if you know that you're not going to want a dog, before, before you decide to have a dog, you should figure out, do you want it? And what problems is it going to have, etc. And once you commit yourself to a certain course like that, you cannot just by whim say, the hell with it, I changed my mind. And the same thing is exactly true with regard to a fetus. You have plenty of warning. You have lots of time to decide. Now, I can think of circumstances in which a woman would rationally uh, decide to take the life of uh, an eight-month-old uh, uh, fetus. Even, let's say, one that's fully formed. Because as long as it's in her body, it has no political right. That's not the same question as is it, is it fully formed. Suppose she's, she had this child by a man. Well, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's a whole, her whole life was centered around the two of them are going to bring him up and have a family, etc. Uh, he's killed in the eighth month. And she has no desire for anybody else. She doesn't want a reminder of him. She doesn't want a child by itself. And this is a purely psychological, let alone, you know, the cases where she has a heart condition and it's her. So, but suppose the psychological, then I say she's got a right to say. She's got a right up until a delivery, however formed or not formed, as long as it's living in her, to say, I don't want this child, I don't want the responsibility to get it, put him out of his misery or put me out of mine. Now, you know, it gets increasingly more dangerous the later you get in the, uh, in the cycle. No, I don't want this to turn into a seminar on uh, abortion, but there's a, there's a number of separate points. When do rights start? When does, a, when does a separate entity start? That's after the cord has been cut. When is it formed, which is earlier, and what moral and political rights do you have, which are not necessarily the same, in regard to a, a formed but not yet born, and then in regard to an unformed, you see? There's a whole spectrum of different moral situations there uh, that have to be analyzed if you want to have a full-fledged uh, uh, discussion. So there's no use me telling you at what point it's formed, because that, I'd have to know, you know much more about structure. What I have to know is only what are the principles that would govern each side. It's like, how should you comb a beard if you have one, and how should you wash your cheek if you don't? And if you're in the middle, you can't come to a philosopher and say, is this a beard yet? <laughs> you know, do you have eight hairs? <laughs> we have no magic to tell you when it becomes a beard. Okay. Go ahead. Could you clarify the conceptual distinction between the evil of initiation of physical force and the concept of right? Because in your example of the desert island with the yeah. few people that had been formed in society, yeah. certainly each person would have to say it was morally wrong to initiate physical force, yeah. and yet the concept of right, you say... All right, well, let's make a distinction between the concept of right and the concept of a right. Now, one is a specification of the other. Right is the broad term, like for virtuous, proper, appropriate, moral conduct. And in that case, if you live on a desert island and somebody lives across the island and you have no organized social system, right and wrong are unaffected. It's right for you to do certain things. It's wrong for you and similarly for him. And one of the things it's wrong for him to do is to uh, initiate physical force against you. Why? Because it violates your rights? No, that would not be the way to formulate it in that situation. You haven't reached the point of saying, let's have a society and these are my prerogatives and these are the agencies to recognize it. 
all of why is it wrong? Because it's an attack on your means of survival, and you can't survive that way. He's counting on you to produce certain things that he's, he wants to get off of you while simultaneously preventing you so he's from achieving you. So he's engaged in a contradiction. Or he's a human being and he's trying to live as an animal. He's engaged in a contradiction. You can describe what he's doing, all the bad consequences it will lead to for you and for him. It all cover the whole situation, but it will not be in terms of your right to life, liberty, property, or anything. It will be in, in, in the broader terms that are appropriate to chapters 7 and 8. Now, the difference is when you have an organized society, you don't count on principles of virtue. And if you did, you would be in a lot of trouble. If that's what the courts, you know, if, the, if you went to court and there were no specific rights to life, liberty, property, and the court had to say, well, this guy is violating independence and integrity. And I suppose you had this situation. Let's forget about rights. Let's just say men need others to follow the, the right virtues, and therefore the moral requirement of man in a social context is that everybody follows the right virtues. Therefore, we simply legislate. Law one, be independent. Law two, have integrity, and so on. And now you go to court, and your neighbor accuses you of being a dependent. <laughs> now what? You say, well, I didn't steal anything. We're not talking about stealing. I'm talking about you are, you know, you're not narrowing it down. The whole thing about rights is they leave you, they leave out theory. They leave out anybody's competing view of what's right and what's wrong. They tell you, you cannot punch somebody in the nose. Uh, that's what it comes down to, you see. But they specify what we'll take as a punch in the nose. You see what I'm saying? And sometimes it's very tricky. But that's what the, exactly what the theory of right is for. If you don't have that, then you're reduced to simply, you have to call out to this guy, you swine, you're living you know, uh, like a parasite. And then he calls back, you too, and then they just have to fight it out. That's it. <laughs> yes. uh, about the right to pursue happiness, I don't understand uh, in what way that's anything more than uh, the right to liberty and property. What what is more about the right to pursue happiness than the right to liberty and property? Why add that? Well, I tried to indicate that. They're, none of them add anything to the others if you want to look at it that way. Once you said the right to life, you've said it all. But once you said the right to property, you've said it all. Or once you said the right to liberty. The right to the pursuit of happiness is specifically concerned with what your ultimate goal may be. It's specifically designed, in effect, to put it in objectivist terms, to have a polemical answer to altruists who come to you and say, you should be living for society. You say, no, I've got a right to live for the pursuit of happiness, you see. I mean, if you said to an altruist, well, but I'm free. He says, yes, but you should be using your freedom to serve others, you see. It's to, it's to, it's to, it's to make selfishness into a recognized feature of the right political system. That was the great idea of the right to the pursuit of happiness. Now, the right to the pursuit of happiness does not mean the duty to pursue happiness. You have a right to go on being a Christian or Jew or whatever you are and say, you know, I'd rather pursue misery. <laughs> or I'd rather just sleep and drink. I don't want either. I guess the point is, if you can take somebody to court and say, he imprisoned me, he took away my right to liberty, right. Uh, he, he stole my goods, he took away my property, but what would you have to do by court to abridge somebody's pursuit of happiness other than take away the liberty I of pre prevent, I think the most obvious example is prevent them from having an abortion. That sentences a woman completely to the death as far as pursuit of happiness is concerned. Compulsory career is completely taking away the right to the pursuit of happiness. And it's not just you're not free. You're not free to do what you want to make you happy. Now, they all imply each other, you know. But the pursuit of happiness is great because it's, it's the tremendous historical advantage that uh, the founding fathers gave us because they built into this country that tremendously controversial formulation. And nobody who dislikes it can repudiate it. And as long as they have that hanging over them, their only way out is a second constitutional convention, which they're agitating for now, which I think is, would be the worst 
you know. I mean, I get scared when they go to the polls to vote for dog catcher, but <laughs> when representatives around the nation go to vote on amending the Constitution, I mean, you just, no one could imagine what would come out of it, except it would be the complete end. Uh, however they try to limit it, you know, it, it will be, it will make the Weimar Constitution look like laissez-faire compared to what would come out of a second, particularly if conservatives are the ones calling it, you know. So if you can fight that, that alone is a lifetime uh, uh, mandate. I mean, you would do more good for history if you could stop a second constitutional convention than any single other insanity uh, in the world. Uh, and I want to go on to the next scene. I just realized we got more here. Oh, government. Now, this is, uh, which page is this? 406, right. Um, the important point here is, uh, on which Ayn Rand used to insist, no one has the freedom to initiate force. Not even the victim of a crime. Uh, assuming it's not an emergency and the police are unavailable. The, 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 the requirement that any rational individual delegate that right. Now, I say that on page 406, uh, oh, about the, I guess, the fifth paragraph from the bottom. The one that starts, physical force is the power of destruction. A, a, we can't have a society if man is free to unleash such a threat against others as and when he chooses. Now, please notice the next sentence. That is not simply and not primarily because rash or evil people will misuse the initiation of force. I make it, a, I stand on my head to say, this applies whatever the threatener's knowledge and character, whether he is informed or ignorant, judicious or rash, just or unjust. In other words, he can be more just, judicious, informed. It is still a disaster if he initiates the use of force by himself, and the, uh, the uh, explanation lies in the fact that what he's initiating is not some form of cooperative endeavor with others, and not some form of completely isolated behavior, but some form of killing others, some form of knocking them on the head with a hammer. And if that is, can be at somebody's discretion, regardless of how rational the society, the person is, the society is finished. Now, to concretize this, let's assume one uh, man finds his wallet missing, and uh, he's got really good reason to believe that uh, a guy two blocks away took it when they were at a bar together. Uh, and he remembers the guy next to him, and he remembers the, the, uh, he didn't have the wallet when he left the bar, and a couple of people told him they saw this guy going, uh, going out uh, with the wallet. So he's not, it's not just ignorant. He, he's, a, he's really the victim. And he, he remembers, he's, he's got clear evidence. That he's not rash. He just doesn't rush off. He says to himself, he's got some friends over, well, you know, what, what should I do? Uh, you know, I don't want to just run off, I want to be fair about this. Well, they say, well, phone the guy. And see, so they phone me, he says, I never saw your wall. I don't know what you're talking about. He says, well, I have three people who swear that they, you know, they saw you leave. We were sitting right next to each other. And the guy said, I don't remember you at that bar. And they, 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 he hangs up and says, no satisfaction. Now what? Well, one of course is, I'll just have to be the victim of injustice. But of course, that's tantamount to just passively lying on down. And what if he had crucial, you know, credit cards or money or blueprints or, you know, some a, a MacGuffin of Hitchcock, you know, the foreign plans and so on. He's got to get it back. He just can't, you know, roll over like that. And he can't go alone to this house. The guy doesn't sound like he wants to talk about it. So they go with several friends and they knock on the door and the guy says, I won't let you in. Now what? Now there's no, there's no government to there. We're not delegating. We're, we're leaving it to rational, just men. Well, I mean, you know, there's no way that you can possibly get around the fact that within an hour, 
This becomes a gang war. That's it. And it's doubtful if you would ever find out because the first thing the guy will do is burn the wallet. Or he'll send it to Madagascar. And consequently, it's going to end up with one gang fighting another gang. And then, of course, that will brood more hostilities. And everyone watching says, I've got to get my own gang. What happens if I come next? Now, that is taking the best and most benign views, an honest, just person who really suffered, and it has to lead to disaster, let alone you know, the, uh, the, the trash that populates uh, uh, the world. So uh, the, the idea that, uh, well, force is like anything else. If a man is rational, let him go out and do it betrays absolute disconnection from reality. I mention this, of course, because that's one of the many ways in which libertarians are dis disconnected from reality. They have no, uh, apparently not even a passing acquaintance uh, uh, with it. Uh, Ayn Rand always held that um, libertarianism was worse than communism. And then if she had a choice, she would rather live under one than the other. Uh, obviously, she didn't think that was much of a choice, but uh, at least the communists had to have some semblance of order, whereas libertarians would just be mass, unstructured gang warfare until everyone was, was slaughtered. Now, I want to point out on page uh, 407 with regard to objective law. There's an important point here. Um, that I'd like us to work out here. I said, uh, I make the point that the meaning of such laws, objective laws, this is the second paragraph of four of them, is independent of the claims of any interpreter. Uh, it can be grasped from the statement of the law itself in contrast to laws forbidding crimes which are not defined in terms of specific physical acts. For instance, Laws against blasphemy, obscenity, immorality, etc., etc. And then I said, in all these latter examples, even when the terms are philosophically definable, it's possible, it's not possible to know from the statement of the law what existential acts are forbidden. Now I want to point that out to you because a standard liberal line on this issue is that the reason you can't legislate against obscenity or uh, immorality, or whatever, blasphemy, is that no one can define it. And since it's indefinable, therefore it can't be subject to legislation. That is completely wrong. There are all kinds of things which are definable, clearly definable, philosophically definable, that are not therefore capable of being the subject of objective legislation. And for instance, take immorality there. Can we define immorality? Absolutely. Not only define, you write a whole book proving why immorality is essentially evasion. Uh, the, the refusal to think in the face of uh, the requirements of life. And I can give as much detail as you. I wrote page after hundreds of pages. So I surely have defined it. All right, suppose we now have a statute saying uh, immorality will be, uh, will be uh, uh, punished. By, uh, by law. It would be like first degree immorality, second degree <laughs> venal, and so on. Now, how would you, how would you, uh, how would you do that? It's, it's objective. Now, leave aside the question of whether that kind of law is right. Can you, do, can you apply or interpret such a law um, uh, in a way that, the, that you, the citizen, know exactly what the court's uh, or the police are going to find criminal and what they're not. And if not, why not? It's objective. So it's objective, but it can't be the subject of an objective law. Why is that? that is that a paradox or not? So you get somebody new each time. Yeah. Uh, it, it exists in the mind and it can't get someone's mind and well, that's a really good point, up to a point. But you said to me, evasion exists in somebody's mind, and the government can't get in the mind and prove the evasion, so it's subjective. Well, that's good as far as it goes, but then are you pushing us into this conclusion? 
since none of us can get into anybody's mind, we can never know when he's evading. So knowing the government can't know, we should all abandon moral judgment. <laughs> Yes. So you said you can be immoral without initiating force. So what's wrong with that? Why can't the government detect that immorality if it's objectively definable and provable? If there's an element of not being able to, to objectively detect to see it. Well, the whole word there is you need to just take one of the words you just used and hammer it. You cannot. No, it's not objective. <laughs> what did we say was the whole virtue of the theory of government that Ms. Rand worked out, that the violation of rights is accessible to what faculty? Perception. It's all like a punch in the nose. Ideology, theory, philosophy is not required to determine whether somebody coerced somebody. On the other hand, whether somebody is immoral, in the broad sense. For instance, are they productive or are they being lazy? Are they honest internally or are they being evasive? Are they pursuing their self-interest when they go to this lousy movie with their wife or are they sacrificing? I mean, those are not perceptually determinable questions. Those are questions which invoke a whole system of philosophy and probably of psychology as well. And therefore, you cannot legislate it without mandating the end of all thought. The end of free thought, meaning the end of all thought, meaning the end of the conceptual level. The only thing that can be the subject of, of governmental action is an object that is perceivable by sensory me. As soon as it enters the uh, conceptual realm, it's outside the function of government prohibition. So don't fall for the idea that, uh, well, the reason we shouldn't have statutes against obscenity is because who can, nobody can know what obscenity is. You certainly can know what obscenity is, but you only know it by means of a whole theory of values, including aesthetics. Uh, uh, and that is, when the government puts its nose in that, that means the end, the complete uh, collapse of its function. All right, and the last thing I wanted to point out here, I believe, is on 408. Uh, of course, the three functions of government you know. And, and this, this paragraph I, I liked. Uh, and after I wrote it, I realized I took it from Gold's speech. So I, there is, you know, you, ha, you have got a non-footnoted version here, but in the actual book, every time I could track down some phrase to something in Ayn Rand's writing, I gave a footnote. Like, uh, uh, to destroy destruction. I kept thinking, gee, that's a really good phrase, and then one day it struck me, it isn't mine. Uh, and uh, I, I tracked it down to Gulf's speech. How many of those escaped me, I don't know. But this is a good paragraph, that one, the third from the bottom. Government is inherently negative. The power of force is the power of destruction, and it can be used, therefore, only to destroy. To destroy what? To destroy destruction. And then the next sentence is mine. It's a very philosophic sentence, but, but good. Uh, for a society to inject this power into any creative realm, that is any you know, productive realm, any realm that pertains to, to a, a sustaining values and achieving life, then you know, the, the attempt is necessarily uh, a contradiction because you're trying to use death, which is what force does, it destroys, as a means of sustaining life. Uh, that's very broad course, but it's, it's, a, it's a good philosophic summary, and then the rest is all pretty obvious. All right, let's take some um, questions on this. Actually, I don't understand exactly what you mean by destroying the crime. Well, kill killers. An eye for an eye. Incarcerate 
use force against those who have used force and thereby prevent them from going on using force. Wipe out the destruction by destroying those who are destroying it. And in the process, you're stopping the actual act of destruction. Because the only one you can use force against is initiators of force, the ones who are engaging in destruction of some kind. Okay. to the objective of Syrian violation of rights? Well, a liable. I'll answer this type of question up to a point, but you are perilously over into the philosophy of law now. But uh, liable to be a violation of rights has to be demonstrably result in a loss of some material asset of yours. And it, liable is the now, leaving aside the Supreme Court, who has hashed that question completely, but libel properly is the written form of, uh, of uh, which slander is the oral form, of spreading malicious falsehoods that would, and don't hold me to a legal definition, but that would tend to harm a person, but not just harm his soul. In a proper society, he has to tie it to a physical consequence. Now, uh, for instance, you're working in a sensitive uh, agency, and I... Uh, Published this thing that you're a member of the mafia, you, you, you've killed uh, people, you've hidden the corpses, etc., and so on. And uh, your employer says, I, you know, I don't know if it's true or false, but this goes over bad with the public, and uh, you lose your job, and uh, you know you had the credit, and the credit is removed from you, and you had I don't know income, and they won't pay you anymore, etc. And then you go back, you go to court, and you have to show this was false. And I have lost a million dollars as a result of it, plus I have been unable to get a job because of it. Well, then that is an indirect way of siphoning off your wealth. Even if the libel perpetrator didn't get the wealth, he, simply, he acted tantamount to that to, to make you lose your wealth, you see. Now, the problem would be, suppose, and unfortunately, this has happened. This has happened, uh, you know, you can't commit libel against the dead. So I have had to just swallow and look the other way uh, how many times since uh, Miss Rand died because of fantastic, fault, provable falsehoods. And the lawyers keep coming back and saying, you can't uh, you know, commit libel against the dead. So I tried to argue, well, what if you could show that this libel harms the sale of her books? So people think, oh, you know, that's so awful, I won't buy the books. And unfortunately, you cannot show it because every new libel keeps their name in the paper. And the result of that is more people hear about the books. So, uh, you know, given the cost of lawyers today, I can't imagine, and given the standards that prevail among celebrities today, you know, what you can do and not do and be, it's just written up casually in People magazine, there's essentially nothing you can say about certain people that they won't benefit by materially. Uh, and from that point of view, uh, com that combined with the Supreme Court, which has made you know, libel for public, against public figures almost unprovable, uh, the, uh, basically, I've thrown out the whole idea of libel. I've made a decision I'm going to live without libel laws, and I don't care who says what. It's not worth the time, and I, you can't prove the, the case the way the courts uh, have it. So I think it's a big mistake, and it lets, it lets people get away with murder. But by the same token, everybody has a certain greater feeling, well, you can say anything about anybody, and they have no recourse, so you don't believe anybody, you see. And, and then every once in a while, there's this hardening action by Doris Day or whichever who says, I've had it, you know, and she'll sue one of these tabloids, uh, and they stop for 30 seconds. And then they go on to the next one. I would hate to be somebody like Frank Sinatra, for instance. Now, I don't know Frank Sinatra or, or Nancy Reagan. Obviously, I don't know them, but uh, I don't know about them. But it, you could only think of, no matter what they ever did in their entire life, how many million, literally million times, that has been distorted and twisted and added to and subtracted from that, that uh, and they have no recourse, and basically they have to make the decision, they're just going to ignore it, that's all. Uh, 
But anyway, I got way off of Larval. Yeah. Um, would you say that vengeance is a valid part of a, a just punishment for criminals? Well, yes, I would say it is, but I'd have to explain it. Uh, is vengeance a valid part of the just of the just motivation of the punishment of criminals? Vengeance, you know, is usually used in a pejorative way to get back at the res uh, at the evil doer, and it implies a certain satisfaction on the part of the perpetrator of, of vengeance that he is personally delivering the punishment and he is seeing the victim rise as a result. So that he's relishing the spectacle, whereas the, you say you're being just with the idea that there's a certain, uh, a certain decorum. The judge and the lawyer and so on is not out for vengeance. He has no personal stake uh, in, in Relishing, he just, you know the, the the punishment. He simply wants to know: Did this man do it or not? And what are the what are the crimes? The court, uh, uh, what is the crime re required by the law? Now, I would say no um, person acting within the justice system should have vengeance as a motive. As a motive, that is, they should be completely calm and weigh the evidence to the judge. The jury, the attorneys, you know, the witnesses, whoever. But I suppose you are on the outside, and it was your child or your wife or whichever, and you know that this crime was committed, uh, and uh, uh, the person is found guilty, and you feel some equivalent of, you know, I hope he rots in hell, and I, you know, you feel not dispassionate justice, but bloody revenge, I think that's absolutely your prerogative, and I think you would be inhuman not to. I, 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 my stomach is turned by the spectacle, which you get on TV periodically, of these Christian mothers whose kids have been murdered, you know, or like by the guy in Milwaukee, or raped, or kidnapped, or whatever, and uh, they say, how do you feel toward... Uh, uh, the killer. Well, they, they say, I pray for his soul. You know, and that turns my stomach because if they loved their child, they couldn't get the words out even if God told them to do it. <laughs> now, you see, Christianity does not teach that vengeance is wrong. It just teaches that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So this is the question that the right person has to, has to practice it. And of course, in objectivism, God has no prerogatives. They all belong to men. Well, let's say one more and then we'll do the last section. Uh, for a law to be objective, the crime must be observable. Is it any different to say it must be measurable? Yes, observable and measurable are not the same thing. For something to be conceptualized, it must be measurable. So in that broad sense, everything we talk about, including everything we have laws about, is measurable. But the law is not concerned to measure. The law is concerned to define all the different ways in which human beings can initiate compulsion against others. And each of those has to be directly or indirectly taken back to some physical affront. It doesn't mean that we have to be in a position to be able to give a measure. What would giving a measurement of murder be? How cold the corpse was, or how deep the knife went, or what? Well, you have to have a standard of whether or not the person is alive. But if his property is stolen, I mean, do you need a measure of how far away it is? Is that? I mean, you're introducing measurement by the back door, so to speak. It's not necessary. As to whether it's alive or not, since you didn't ask that question, uh, although you didn't ask that question, uh, I strongly go by uh, the brain death standard. In other words, if the brain is gone, I don't care if consciousness is there or the heart is there. If it's irretrievably gone, I regard that as death. So if all somebody does 
is destroy your, you know, uh, what is it, the cerebrum. But the vegetative centers remain, and you're in a coma thereafter, I regard that as murder. And by the same token, I don't think there's any further act of murder in pulling a plug. Assuming, of course, that that's really was the situation. That's in case you want to ask about murder. Now, uh, let's go to the last uh, sequence on um, the polemics. Basically, there, uh, the, all this on the old left and the new, uh, I just put in for the sake of completeness. I'm afraid that that section will date very rapidly, although I did have an attempt to indicate that I wasn't talking about the 60s, but the 90s representatives of that new left. However, I think it's going to die out. So it'll be a, uh, this is one of those things where there'll be a footnote from somebody saying they used to be. Um, but the, uh, <clears throat> the um, part that is uh, more interesting in the statism, which you all know inside out, I'm sure, is uh, anarchism. Well, I've really covered that, but I just cash in on the conclusion on 4.13. The top paragraph that anarchy is possible, but not anarchism. And that why the minute you had anarchy, you would have to go back to uh, some kind of dictatorship. So that uh, uh, this second paragraph is a, is a good point. If words have to stand for objects in reality, then the only reference of anarchism the only possible political system it designates is some variant of statism. Now, I maintain that, therefore, anarchism means statism, literally denotes it, because what the anarchists offer as a definition is something that can never exist in reality. So if we are to talk about what they, what they uphold as a system functioning in reality, as desirable or undesirable, what they advocate in reality is only a form of dictatorship. And so uh, this is important methodologically. You cannot go by somebody's definition and defiance of reality. Suppose he says there's three states. I need a coin for this, bro. You got a coin? Uh, well, there's three states. One is this coin like this, and one is this coin like this, and the third is, and he takes his hand away. There's no other state. It immediately is one way or the other way. Now, what's the third side? There is no third side. It's one side or the other side, and the same is true. Either you have rights or you don't. If you don't have rights, including the mechanism to defend them, that's dictatorship. Therefore, you can call it anarchism. You can call it utopianism. You can call it the second stage of communism. doesn't make any difference if you call it. In, you have to ask, what is it in actual reality? Uh, and now, the um, other thing here that I wanted to point out, which I had uh, some fun writing on the top of 414. All the false rights, or not all of them, who could even dream of writing all of them? But but it was fun to how to juxtapose all these. And they're all definitely, I think you can see, uh, things that have strong champions. The only one you might not recognize is a knowledge of famous people's secrets. What is that called today? What? The right to know. And that's all it means. Uh, the right to know is the right for journalists to plunder somebody's privacy and spread it all over the front pages because the people have a right to know. And then um, I like juxtaposing highbrow TV programs and a lifetime supply of condoms, because <laughs> it goes to show that these people are not discriminating. I mean, they couldn't care less whether it's body or mind, whatever it is, they throw that in the pot, too. And all these are smoke-free workplace, an obscenity-free library, an evolution-free curriculum, and a sodomy-free bedroom, an abortion-free hospital, or free abortion. You can that too, you know, it's the liberals and the conservatives. And it was fun to just get all of this 
<laughs> but I had to cut most of them out because, you know, there's just too many. But it's enough to suggest a society run wild with no idea whatever of what is right, what can you demand, what is the function of the government, just anything out of any context which somebody wants and can find three other people to agree with them, they got a right, we throw that on the pot. Then it gets in the Democratic Party platform, then 12 years later in the Republican Party platform, <laughs> and then it becomes dogma, self-evident, you know. Um, and uh, which leads nicely into the last topic of uh, on 415, the evil of conservatives. If we know that politics depends on an entire philosophy, then you have to know that every single right-wing movement without exception, what's called right-wing, is lethal. That doesn't mean every single right-wing individual. There are people who are not objectivists, uh, who are honest, who can write good things, and who generally are not too tainted by what's going on. But I'm talking when it gets to be five of them and they make a movement, it's hopeless. Uh, and that applies to Protestants. I've got the whole list of some of them there. Protestants, Catholics, or Jews. That's the moral majority, William Buckley and Commentary Magazine. States' rights, that's the Republicans. Libertarians, you know who that is. And Southerners, you know who that is. And that's just, you know, the scratch of the surface. And then I'd just like to read the ending here. Objectivists are not conservatives. They do not seek to preserve the present system, but to change it at the root. In the literal sense of the word, we are radicals. Radicals for freedom, radicals for man's rights, radicals for capitalism. We have no choice in the matter. We have no choice because in philosophy, we are radicals for reason. Thank you. You see, it tied back to epistemology, and next time we'll do capitalism. Now we have time for questions, basically, I guess, on the whole chapter or on anything. I don't care. You mean passing laws? No, making laws. Making laws. Right. Writing and making laws. Oh, why doesn't Ms. Rand say there are four functions of government? What is it? The police, the army, the courts, and the lawmakers. She is not defining the institutions, but the functions of government. And she's saying that substantively, if you want to stop force, you have to stop it at home, abroad, and when it's simply a matter of a disagreement rather than aggression at home or abroad. That's the three substantive functions. But now those functions require themselves many different branches of government which take you into political theory. Obviously, someone must pass the laws governing the police, the army, the military, the, uh, the, the, the courts, and defining what all the different crimes are that the courts, you know, are going to uh, 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 take care of and deal with. Someone has to conduct a foreign policy and decide when the army is to be used and when it isn't. Uh, someone has to, you know, write a criminal code and a civil code, etc. And then these things have to be administered. If there's going to be a government at all, you know, there has to be personnel, and they have to have a, a place to meet, and there has to be election laws, and there has to be eligibility requirements, and you're getting down into what's called you know, the, the structure and details of government, which is what political theory, political theory is all about. What are the different ways, that, uh, things that have to be done? And then there's a lot of controversial questions. For instance, should there be a federal police force? like the FBI? Or should all police work be only on the, the state uh, level? If there is a federal police, how do you decide which laws they enforce, you know, and which, uh, what if there's an overlap? Uh, do we need a CIA or, you know, an overseas uh, spy network in order to determine the potential for, all of this is a tremendously complex questions, what all these institutions are, how they should be uh, def defined, demarcated, populated, staffed, 
overseen, integrated. I mean, the main job, however, of all that was done by the Founding Fathers. Because the whole thing about the Constitution was to say, we're going to divide it into three branches, and we're going to have this great idea of checks and balances, so no one of them will get out of hand. Now, they didn't answer every question, but they sure gave tremendous, brilliant answers to all that. That is not philosophy. What philosophy is concerned with in government is, is the same as what it's concerned with in regard to rights. In regard to rights, it lays down the fundamental and its obvious derivatives, life, liberty, property. Then there's all the stuff of the Bill of Rights and so on that's too detailed for philosophy. Similarly, in regard to government, it lays down its essential function and then the main obvious ways in which it carries out that function, at home, abroad, in court. As to the whole details of how to erect the government that does that, you're back now into political theory. So uh, you see, you cross-classify if, if you say we need one more. We need a hundred more if you're going to mix the function with the agencies that do it. OK. That's, I mean, it's a good question. It's a bad question that's illuminating. Okay, <laughs> to pay, you know to carry back on my opening. Yeah. Is uh, vigilante action ever justified in situations where the government fails to mete out justice? Well, that's a very hard question. Is vigilante action ever justified in situations where the government fails to mete out justice? I mean, if you've taken the New York subway, uh, you feel a certain, uh, you know pleasure when you see one of these vigilante, what do they call them, the uh, health agents, well, yeah, guardian angels, yeah. <laughs> guardian angels, yeah. Because, you know, the, although they might strike you, the chances are much less than the ordinary passenger would. Um, when you exist in a proper society or, or a semi-proper society, vigilantism is out for the same reason that anarchism is out. Because you have delegated your right to retaliate to a government. And therefore, instead of you yourself getting a posse and trying to put the thing to rest, uh, solve the problem, you call in the government. Uh, the problem becomes this. When a government breaks down past a certain point, people are put in a position of complete helplessness. The government will not give them any satisfaction for any protection against roving gangs, etc. And yet, uh, they can't just go and keep looking the other way and waiting because they have to get to work and they have to function. And it's an insoluble dilemma. Uh, it's very dangerous to get involved in that because you court direct retaliation. Uh, I don't want to dog with us. I, I want to just say this. By my best understanding, it's against the law to counsel vigilantism. And properly so. I mean, it amounts to advocating anarchy and the overthrow of the government, you see. So I couldn't, even if I, uh, if I believed in it, I couldn't, from a public platform, advocate vigilantism. The only, I'll have to leave it to you, therefore, this way. You have to decide in your own mind is there any way you could achieve your ends through the use of legal private defense agencies? You know, you can hire bodyguards if you can afford it. Or you can have neighborhood patrol groups, you know, who uh, register with the police department. And in many places, that's, they're considered valuable adjuncts uh, to the police. Do you have any legal recourse that you can afford to supplement the failing government? If not, you have to say to yourself, basically, can you move to another part of the country or another neighborhood? And if worse comes to worse and you can't, then you have to say to yourself, I break with this society. This society is now unlivable in the most literal sense. You cannot live in it. Therefore, I'm going to do what I have to and take the consequences. And I leave it to your imagination. <laughs> Uh, what the consequences are. I think it's a tragedy that we've reached the point where uh, you can't scoff at the question. You know, 25 years ago, I would laugh and say, well, you know, you don't have to worry about that. There's more important things. But the way things are going now, um, it, it, the breakdown of law and order is perceivable in large areas and is growing. 
And uh, I, I, as a speaker, I'm put in a position that I cannot say anything except uh, support your local police, particularly when they are the object of vicious attacks by every pressure group, as was happening in LA recently. Uh, where it's obvious that end in itself on the part of pressure groups to oust the chief of police so that the next one will be intimidated before he comes into office. Uh, I mean, it's terrible, it's really. Anybody that even stays in police work today is a hero, uh, given what the, the abuse that they're subject to. Okay, we've got two more questions. Um, okay, you and then... uh, I'm not aware of any political party right now who has a valid philosophical base. And yet we've got politics, we've got, I'm sorry, we have elections coming up here every two years. What can we do in politics? Do you have to get a complete extent of attention or just an ad hoc basis when you find some one individual who seems okay? I, I wish I had an answer. I have no answer to that. What can you do in politics to make things better? Should you abstain? Well, I'll, I'd rather give you a long speech, which would amount to there's not much you can do because it all depends on basic education. You see. Uh, my attitude is this. If I can find a candidate for some office that, I wouldn't say is less bad, but that is not actively disgusting, <laughs> I usually vote. Now, I, I couldn't vote the last time. Although I, I now, well, I won't say it because I'll be badgered forever. Uh, I didn't vote the last time. Um, but what Orange County gives you a tremendous chance uh, where I live for a voting opportunity because we have a, in every election and sometimes between elections dozens of horrendously expensive bond issues that they want the voters to approve. So the idea is to have 100% taxation in this one county. Uh, and the, uh, the, all the bureaucrats and their allies give you, a, you know, like 20 different propositions. Resolve that we shall spend 38 trillion on the welfare of defective teeth and resolve, you know, <laughs> this goes on page after page and I just go for the no's. I just press no all the way down the page, you know. Uh, that's about it though. I, I don't know, I don't know as far as voting. Uh, I can't even imagine who I would uh, uh, vote for. And uh, as far as forming a political party, I mean, good luck. <laughs> or joining and taking one over if you can do it. But uh, I just don't uh, know. I don't see the success on the horizon. Uh, we have the last one was yes. Two part, two part question. Bottom line, two parts will be. In the following situation, I can't hear you. In the following situation, how would objectivists evaluate and B, how would an objectivist government respond, if at all? And the situation is with an objectivist government in a nation, if a group of people wanted to withdraw to a geographically defined area and decree by unanimous consent within their geographic area, either more things would be outlawed than forced and fraud, mm -hmm. or B, that amongst themselves, forced and fraud were not going to be outlawed. How would objectivists evaluate that, and would an objectivist government do anything about it? No. Oh, that's the answer. Now let me repeat the question. Uh, <clears throat> suppose a group of people within a, a, a country governed by an objectivist government, in other words, a free country with individual rights, uh, wanted to form withdraw from the main society and form their own society in which either A, they outlawed more things than the initiation of force, or B, they agreed that some acts of force were okay. How would an objectivist respond to that and what would the government do? An objectivist would respond to that as being reprehensible and evil on both variants as being entirely outside the prerogative of those individuals. It would be like if they decide to have an enclave where they will legalize crime. Is that okay? No, crime is not 
their prerogative or where they will take innocent people who, who agree and start beating them. No. We, I covered that earlier, didn't I? That you can't, you cannot give up an inalienable right. You can't alienate your own rights. But secondly, so it would be completely morally corrupt in both areas. Secondly, the government would not permit it. The government would not permit it. And this is the principle that Ms. Rand discussed in her discussion of what topic? What is what she's asking called when one group decides to start their own country? Secession. Secession can never be done or countenanced by a government if what the seceders are trying to establish is a less free country than the one that they're seceding from. Now, you can make a case if you've got a dictatorship or even a mixed economy. You want to have an enclave of freedom. And if the government stops you, which of course it will do, but if you could negotiate it, that's, that's okay. But to say we've got a free country, but we want to secede to start a dictatorship, a semi-dictatorship, or however you want to word it, absolutely not. They have no right in the world, and the very fact that the government is there to stop force at home or abroad, as soon as anybody talks about the use of force against the innocent or against each other or which, whichever, they become objectively a threat to the other citizens. And they, as, we can't let that kind of threat out of our jurisdiction. We can't let these criminals, in effect, start their flourishing enterprise in Ohio, you know, uh, when you live in the next state, and the next thing you know, they're going to start invading. Uh, and from that point of view, they have no rights, whatever. Rights to start a government are predicated on, not on national self-determination, not on the purity of the blood of the people that are starting it, not on the unanimity of the vote that they took. And none of that entitles you to start a government. Government is an agency to respect rights, to defend and protect rights. The right to start a government presupposes and starts with I hold these rights to be inalienable, and the function of government is only to protect them. If that's what they're ready, they are in, then they have to be aberrant to even raise the question. Thank you very much.